Hort. Good girl, Holly. All right. Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays. I'll have a, an upcoming subscriber Sunday video where subscribers send in photos of their landscapes uh, in the next few weeks. I'll let you know more about that when that's coming up. Uh, these are questions, these are gardening questions that were asked in last week's uh, question and answer video. You can just ask questions down below this video uh, if you want to participate. I picked about 20 questions and you know I'm, I can't answer all the questions that get answered, asked on the channel and a lot of them are duplicates or there's just so many comments. I, I really just write down about 20 questions that I think are uh, haven't been asked recently or follow-ups to other questions from the previous weeks and kind of fit in the line of that. Uh, so don't take it personally if I'm not answering your questions. And I appreciate you guys participating because you do ask great questions. I keep thinking that I'm, one day I'm going to have to skip a, skip some months on this just to, uh, you know, have fresher, what seems like fresher questions at some point. But you guys keep coming up with questions. So uh, I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for your participation. This week, uh, I put up a seeding video for fall vegetables, a direct seeding. I direct seeded some of the... Uh, uh, beets and other things directly in the garden and then um, uh, other things got seeded on the light rack in the house. Uh, so the fall vegetables, fall vegetables are underway. Summer vegetables are, some have wind, you know, wound down already. Some are still producing over there. Uh, but it hasn't been the greatest uh, vegetable season for me really. I mean I've gotten a lot of stuff out of it and if you watch that video you can see I've just got buckets of things this past week. But uh, it hasn't been, last year I had a, a much better vegetable season overall. We had a cool spring followed by that ridiculously hot June. It was dry a lot of the time so I was having to water a little more than I normally have to water. It just this hasn't been the best uh, vegetable season overall but um, not bad either. Uh, so but more, more than I could eat. So how can you complain about that? I'm still giving things away. Uh, what else? Uh, seeding, I also put up a video on the successful annuals, a lot of which had been done from seed. Uh, this, uh, uh, the salvia that's behind me and uh, uh, several other things that are around me back here. Uh, I, I just went through the, my, my top 10 annuals for this season and I didn't even cover. And that was like a third of the actual annuals that are in this landscape uh, this year. And to ask what your guys' is most uh, what, what you guys really liked uh, in your gardens this year and I read all of those responses so thank you for participating there as well and then there should have been a perennial video uh, unless something's gone terribly wrong I'm shooting this on Friday the perennial video should be going up on Saturday for uh, top perennials for this season uh, and now you're seeing this on Sunday um, so let's see uh, consultations I had said several weeks back that I had a bunch of consultation spots available here in August and you guys really filled them in. I mean, I'm amazed. Uh, I had 15 consultations this past week uh, and I limited it to three a day. So that was literally the maximum amount that I could have had uh, for the week. So I appreciate you guys uh, signing up for those. Uh, one of them, all of them are great. I mean, it's really, it's nice meeting folks. Uh, it's nice being able to help where I can, if I can. I mean, there, there's been a couple times here or there that I, I question whether I was helpful or not. Uh, but uh, uh, most of the time I think I am. Uh, there was a uh, one though where a person just wanted to show me the before and after because they had been watching the channels since kind of the beginning, the channel since the beginning of COVID. And uh, uh, look, here's the before photo of this uh, of this property, and uh, here is the after uh, photo. Um, you can just see how absolutely what an amazing transformation has actually jumped ahead of me because he's completed the siding on the house and the front porch area and a lot of things that I still want to do here. But, uh, he's actually not, not only did he, uh, uh, did he jump on board, but he, 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 he they, they passed me by, um, but a beautiful transformation. And again, I appreciate all the, uh, uh, all the consultations. Uh, so thank you guys for that. Um, let's get to some questions from last week's uh, video. Somebody mail ordered some azaleas and they got brown spots uh, throughout, you know, throughout the plants. Think, thinks it's a fungal leaf spot or something and uh, wants to know what they would do if they would plant them into the landscape or return them. Uh, if it was actual some sort of disease issue, I would definitely uh, return them or ask for my money back or whatever they would want to do. Um, if it's just the top of the leaf scraped a little bit and there's a brown spot, and it hasn't gone all the way through the leaf. A lot of times, that is actually um, that's actually flea beetles. Uh, the uh, uh, there's a t there's a particular flea beetle that has become a major issue in the nursery industry. 
Uh, it was when I was, uh, as I was finishing up my nursery, it was getting worse and worse and worse across the, uh, across the entire nursery industry. And so if that's, if that's what you're seeing on top of the leaf is just a, a scraped off place and then that place browned out, that's likely what it was. And that I wouldn't worry about. For whatever reason, we don't see that. There are flea beetles that damage plants in the landscape. But this particular flea beetle um, is really a nursery problem. I mean, I've, I've talked about it before. It's in the containers above the ground. It loves that bark mix that we use in the uh, nursery business. And uh, it's become a real problem. Uh, got, people are having to spray a lot more than they've ever, you know, or, you know, they're spraying a lot more than they had before, you know, leading up to uh, having this problem. Uh, and it's, I, I still get a lot of uh, emails from the state of North Carolina and other places. And uh, it's the co topic of conversation virtually throughout the nursery business is flea beetles, flea beetles, flea beetles, and how to control them. And so um, that is within the realm of possibility of what it is. And then I wouldn't, I, but that's just me because I know what the damage looks like. Um, but if it is a if it is a disease issue, that's something I'm going to return. I, I want my money back probably on uh, from the uh, from the company. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, so somebody has some vinca vine, the ground cover perennial vinca that blooms with a little lavender flowers. I don't know if it's vinca minor or vinca major uh, that they have, but it's brown underneath and just has a nice it's a little foliage on the top. Uh, and wanted to know if they could cut it down and it would rejuvenate. Yes, you can definitely cut it down and it will rejuvenate. It'll be the, one of the last things alive on earth. Uh, I don't think you'll hurt it um, by mowing it down. You could probably do it with a weed eater uh, or, you know, or head shears, weed eater, lawn mower, whatever you could take in there to, to mow it down, but it'll come right back out from that. I might do that in the late winter. Uh, if I was trying to kill it, I might do it now in the heat of the summer on a hot summer day. Uh, but if I'm not trying to kill it and I'm trying to rejuvenate it, uh, uh, maybe uh, sometime in the middle of March, um, I would get out there and, and cut it down some and maybe clean leaves off of it and that kind of thing at that same time if it gets buried in leaves during the winter time because that could have a negative impact on it too. A lot of our shade ground covers, uh, a lot of ground covers in general are so good at covering the ground, they actually collect debris underneath them and, you know, um, and, and decline in time. Uh, because of that, so uh, it might be give you an opportunity just to clean, to mow them off, get the leaves out, clean up all the debris that's in the area, and then fertilize them. You know, at the same time uh, with an organic fertilizer, and it should flush right back out quickly. But again, I don't think you're going to kill your vinca, even if you did it now. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked about um, annuals uh, for the full sun. If you go back and watch that annual video that I put up this week, the 10, all 10 annuals that were in that uh, video, I didn't show uh, the uh, shade in patients. I didn't show the, um, I didn't show any of the shade annuals that are back here. Everything that I showed in that video is in the full sun pretty much all day. I will say that this line on the back of this turf is in the shade a little earlier than other things, but anything in that front garden space. So that would have been the first seven items of the 10 that were in that video were in the front garden out there. It is in the full sun from the time the sun comes up in the morning, you know, 715 it comes across the building, across the street, and it's on them until it still would be, if it wasn't cloudy right now, it would still be in the sun right now at uh, 3 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so any of that stuff uh, in, in that video uh, would work in the full sun. And the, one of the things about, you know, growing things in full sun, and I said this in a consultation the other day, is I plant my annuals much closer together than any tag would ever say. And part of that strategy is that each of them is shading the roots of the one that's next to them. A lot of the heat stress, we're, when we're talking about sun damage and sun stress on plants, a lot of it is, is actually happening from the sun getting down to the roots on your plants. It's like having a tree out in the middle of your front garden with this much of a mulch circle around it. And every single time you mow the grass, you expose the root to that tree to the full sun and wonder why the sun tree doesn't grow very quickly or the tree loses its leaves early every year or the tree doesn't get fall color. It's under a lot of stress. I mean, in normal situation, a tree wouldn't be growing out in the middle of a lawn like that. It'd be growing alongside of other trees uh, and each of them would be shading each other's roots. And so that's one of the strategies of planting thick. Um, I'd rather plant a smaller area thickly uh, than a large area thin. 
um, because the sun will have way more of an impact on a plant sitting there by itself. So each of these is shading one another. And even though it's out here in the full sun, especially in the front garden, uh, cooking, um, they're shading one another. So I've got shade, some part shade things mixed in with some full sun things. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's more of a mixture in here than you would see in other gardens. It's mostly because the roots are being protected by the, each of the surrounding plants. Uh, there you go. Let's see. Somebody has, um, so, okay, here's another one about the black foliage on the bottom of a plant. They've got some asters and they look completely healthy up on the top, but they're in a crowded situation like I just described and the foliage is turning black on the bottom. There are occasions, uh, especially if you're overhead irrigating or you're in an area that gets a lot of rain, maybe there's a lot of dew on the plants in the morning. If plants get this close together, they can start holding some water uh, down near the soil. Imagine how humid it is between the soil and, and the bottom of where you're seeing the green leaves on that plant if all this stuff is so tightly packed together. So there is definitely a little more opportunity for some leaf spot issues and some leaf disease issues um, when it's like this. And so I really try not to overhead irrigate or overhead irrigate as little as possible. Keeping, you know, I don't want to trap a lot of water down uh, in the bottom and I make sure things are actually dry before I'm watering them. Uh, uh, you know, that can have some, some impact on that. But if you see things thinning down at the bottom and they look, you know, almost black like that, that's generally probably staying too wet down at the base of the plant. You might want to cut the other things away from it just a bit and get a little more air movement into the bottom of that plant. Uh, you know, and I, I do go around and rescue a few things here and there you know, just cut around some things that um, I'm concerned might get choked out or, you know, uh, change colors or defoliate. Uh, got a bird, uh, bird and hydrangea over here. Uh, you, there are times where you would cut around things just to get, get a little more air movement around them if you're seeing that kind of damage. But that's likely what it is. It's just staying wet underneath all of that thick growth. Uh, let's see. Somebody said their hellebores look bad here in August, but they just planted them like in the fall of last year. Be completely normal for a first year hellebore. It's one of the reasons hellebore, hellebores are so expensive in general. It takes years and years to get them to flower. So generally you're being sold one. That's the first time it flowered uh, and it's still a very young plant. And so I would expect them to kind of go through rough patches in that first year. They should come up next spring and uh, be tougher. Uh, than they were this year. You could question if they're in too much sun, you know, if they're really cooking back. Uh, you know, it's within the realm of possibility they're getting too much midday sun. Uh, so you might want to go out and analyze that. If that's not the case, then uh, I think it's just a first year planting issue. Uh, somebody asked me just for a book um, update because I had talked about the fact that I am publishing a book and I have a signed contract with a publisher and it's all underway, but it's going to be the spring of 24 when it's published. Um, I'm uh, a little ways away from finishing any kind of manuscript, but anyway, tw 2024 spring, and I have another plan attached to that that I'm um, that I'm that I'm cooking uh, that may happen at the exact same time that I'm I'm pretty excited about, but um, it's it's still underway in the works and uh, partially done. Okay. Uh, so so uh, here's another question about something scorching. Somebody has their hostas are scorching uh, in the August um, she, uh, in the August sun and uh, wanted to know if you know uh, you know if, if they need to move them you know if they're, if they're the first year in the ground you know hosta are pretty I mean I see hosta growing in the full sun all the time around here uh, not necessarily the white ones like the whiter the variegation or the wider the variegation is in the leaf uh, the white or gold or whatever it is the more likely they are to burn but the greener, bluer varieties, I see them in lots of sun all over the place, but I think it's an adapted thing. So, you know, if you take one out of a greenhouse and go stick it in the full sun the first summer, it's probably gonna burn and burn quite a bit. But even mine back here in the shade where we've had intense, intense heat are definitely rough looking. Uh, my, my hosta have definitely looked better in August in the past than they do right now. Uh, even ones in a, you know, even the ones that are really shaded well uh, don't look that great. And so I don't know that I wouldn't let them go to sleep and come back up next spring 
and see if they do a better job of adapting uh, next year. Maybe it's a slightly different year just in general uh, and then decide to move them at that point. Hosta is something you, you, you can dig them out of the ground whenever. Um, you're not going to have a hard time digging them out of the ground and you can divide them when you do. Uh, so I don't know that I would stress about it all that much, but if they are white or gold or have really broad variegations, uh, a lot, those are more apt to burn in the direct sun. Okay, uh, let's see. That was the hostas. Okay, um, so somebody asked me, I talked about uh, having mulch just way, way too thick and creating anaerobic conditions and what that would look like. Somebody asked what that would look like in their plants. And so when, you, when I talk about having anaerobic conditions, I mean, we're talking about just not having enough air in the soil. So the, the soil becomes waterlogged and it displaces the air from the soil and the microbes in the soil need air. Those, micro, those are the same microbes that are exchanging nutrients uh, for the sugars that the plant's producing by making chlorophyll. So the photosynthesis process produces sugar that feeds these microbes and in return these microbes find nutrients that the plant needs and basically feed the plants, keep the plants healthy so the plant can keep making uh, sugars. Uh, for them to survive, and that's how that, that they, they work together like that, okay? If you flood the soil beneath uh, your plants, uh, you know, spe you know with, a mul with a rotting mulch, it will displace a lot of that air uh, in the soil. And what happens there is you're going to have nutrient deficient plants. So they can't, they're not going to be able to get the iron they need, or the phosphorus they need, or the potassium they need, something. Doesn't matter what it is, but you're going to see you're going to see plants that are off colored in some way or another. It might be in the new growth. It may be in the old growth. It may be that you see the veins and the leaves uh, differently. Uh, it may be that uh, you see a purple hue uh, in the new growth. Uh, that's sometimes a, a potassium deficiency that we'll see in things like tomatoes. But uh, that, that's what will happen um, if you create anaerobic conditions. And it's easy to do. I got another question coming up where somebody's tried to love something to death. And that's basically what they're doing. They're creating a waterlogged soil and then nothing else works properly uh, if, if there's no air in, in the soil. Because uh, everything needs to breathe, even the things living in the soil. Uh, okay, let's see. So somebody asked about bulbs for pollinators. So I put up the bulb video. That's the other video that you'll see from this week. I couldn't remember. Um, I think I put that up on Monday, the bulb order that I have for this season. And I talked about not buying in uh, many cold treated bulbs and I'm just from an environmental impact, just thinking I'm doing this, refrigerating all these bulbs and then trashing them at the end of the season every year. It just uh, seems super wasteful. So I'm gonna grow things that I can naturalize in my own garden. That's the point of that video. And um, I'm hoping to, moving forward with this channel, like I said last week, try to convince people of the same thing. Let's do the things we can do in our own gardens and have our own gardens look fantastic based on the areas that we live in. And then we'll visit the other gardens <laughs> through photography or vacationing. Um, but they want to know about bulbs for pollinators. Daffodils, older, especially older varieties of daffodils are actually quite good for pollinators. A lot of the new hybrids, we've seen some of the fragrance disappear. And you know we see this with hybridization sometimes. Sometimes it's better for pollinators. Sometimes it goes the other way and it's just meant to have a larger flower for the human buying it and you know the pollinator kind of loses out on it uh, so some daffodils are are good for pollinators crocus are very good for pollinators especially the tommies that i have in my or my uh, bulb order uh, from color blends those are uh, those are very good for uh, pollinators muscari uh, is another one uh, that's very good for pollinators uh, and then we actually have there's a few uh, native bulbs like claytonia which i've never um, I actually planted uh, but it's a native bulb that's great for pollinators. And then the species tulips, I have three varieties of species tulips coming, also pollinators. Uh, they're great for the early, you know, if you have a warm day early in the season, uh, great for bees. But not all bulbs are. Um, a lot of them are just for humans. Um, you know, some of the tulips are, some of the tulips aren't. Same thing with the daffodils. Uh, through hybridization, sometimes we change them for the better, sometimes for the worse in terms of the pollinators. Uh, but. There, there are some that are and some that aren't. And it's something to Google. I mean, if it's something that's interesting to you and you won't only put out bulbs that bloom in February or March that are going to draw pollinators at that time of the year, definitely worthy cause. I would definitely go for it. 
Uh, let's see. Somebody has, this is, man, I, uh, after my house, my house was, my old house was built for me. Uh, I was, um, you know, the, fir the first person in that house. There was just construction debris everywhere. Every time I dug a hole in that landscape, anywhere within 20 feet of that house, I pulled something out from the construction of that house that had been pushed around. This person has a particularly bad problem, which is all the builder sand was used to backfill the foundation. So imagine it's, you know, this just that coarse builder sand is this deep around their foundation. I think that I would definitely want to get rid of a, every time I plant something in that, I'm not, I'm not gonna go in there and dig it all out, but certainly every time I plant something in there, I'm gonna get rid of some of it, um, distribute it somewhere else in the garden. Um, they won't hurt anywhere else if you just spread it out thin uh, in other places. And then add some compost, some pine bark soil conditioner if you, if you can find it in your area. Uh, you could definitely uh, pull the things out that are there and you know, put the wood chips down like I've been talking about recently. And just one time, you know, just let them rot down pretty quick, you know, or not rot, but uh, let them break down pretty quickly. That'll help improve that soil. And that stuff will get mixed in when you plant. But I'm probably gonna stick the shovel in for every plant that I plant and pull out two or three shovelfuls of that stuff and get rid of it and replace it with something uh, else as I go. Uh, but what a pain, you know, but, you know, it's this laziness at the end of a project um, uh, leads them to, you know, have to go through that. Uh, somebody has their tulip poplar tree is losing its leaves in August. All the surrounding tulip poplars near them uh, are getting their normal fall color and, uh, and months later after this one is. I, the only, you know, I don't, I don't know where the tree is sitting. If the tree is sitting in a lawn, just like I talked about in that earlier question, uh, it's a very unnatural place for a tree to sit in a lawn. And I don't know if the sun is able to get the roots. Uh, I don't know if it's drier in that area, if you have more things planted around it. Uh, so. You know, it could be, could be drought stress, could be sun stress, uh, could be that the tree is, um, could be that the tree is sick. And then there's variability. Okay, so the, these, these, these tulip poplars came up from seed and they were crossed with parent plants. It's within their own possibility. You're going to get variability, you know, in trees regardless. And so, um, you know, in, in, in our actual natives, you know, where we think they're all the same, they're not at all the same uh, because they're, they're seedling crosses. So there's, I doubt it's seedling variability <laughs> if it's an eight week difference in the time the leaves are dropping off. I would say seedling variability if it was a week or two difference and maybe the fall color was a slightly different shade, those kinds of things. This seems more like it's gotta be stress uh, of some kind. And so, um, you know, uh, I don't know. It, it may be that you wanna try, maybe next summer try to water this tree a bit um, around this area uh, in July and see if you see if that extends the time and then you'll know that it's uh, uh, related to uh, drought. If it's in a lawn, make the bed around it bigger and mulch the area in a larger area around it and see if that can help as well. Uh, so <laughs> what would I suggest in place of a river birch? Um, anything? Uh, <laughs> I, had, I had a river birch at the old house and it was, I covered it in a video uh my gosh what a hog for water and nutrients and space and everything and just constantly dropping leaves and sticks on the ground it's just a terrible uh, uh urban tr or it's a terrible tree for just a, like a, in a subdivision it's a great tree i love river birches don't get me wrong the fall, the fall color the peeling bark you know the the just the stature of them i love them they don't belong in uh, urban landscape. They don't belong in landscapes in small lots. You know, if you have a giant lot, yes. Uh, but they just, they're always, they're always trashy. That one was just such a pain. I regret, 25 years, 23 years I was in that house or something like that. Maybe 24 years I was in that house. And that, I planted it day one, probably. <laughs> and 24 years later, I was like, oh gosh, this tree will not stop bug. You know, it's just constantly doing something. You know, you're picking up after it every day. Uh, but it was beautiful. I'm not taking away from the fact that it wasn't, wasn't beautiful, but almost anything is a better uh, urban tree uh, than, a, uh, than a river birch. Um, uh, something like Halesia, Carolina silverbell is something I would consider using. Native fringe tree uh, would get a similar size, maybe a little smaller uh, than a river birch, but uh, a great ornamental tree. I have that service berry out in the front garden here. 
Um, I'm figuring it's full sun since it's a river birch, so I'm giving you full sun ones. If it's part shade, then obviously red buds and uh, red buds and dogwoods come into play. Uh, but those are ones that just pop into my head pretty quickly. Carolina silverbell and uh, service berry, um, native fringe tree. Okay. All right. Somebody's going to tell me how much they love birches and the bottom for sure. That's what I always get if I give my opinion on one of these things. Again, I love birches as well, and it's a great native tree. Um, so, uh, you know, not, not, not knocking them, just saying they're not necessarily great in a small urban lot. Okay, um, somebody asked me about overwintering ornamental grasses in containers. They don't want to plant them into the ground. Uh, you know, you still have time here in August to probably get them established uh, and have them survive through the winter pretty well. When I talk about not planting grasses in the fall, I'm really talking about as they're going dormant in uh, late September, October, November. So if you are following my lead about not planting them later in the year, I think you still have time, but if you don't have time, if you, if you find that you don't have time later uh, to get them in the ground or you don't want to, or the project isn't ready or whatever, uh, overwintering them is just gonna require leaving them outside on any day where the pot's not gonna freeze solid and letting them dry out as much as possible between waterings because dormant grasses will rot very easily in containers. So in the winter time. So we had that problem at the nursery all the time. We had to put everything pot to pot uh, and then have, and so we could be ready to cover uh, on cold nights when the pots might freeze and having the pots close together insulated them, but having the pots close together and having additional rainfall in the winter and having it not evaporate as fast led the grasses to be particularly tricky to not overwater uh, during the winter time. So again, leave them out on any day where it's not going to be frozen solid, put them in the garage. If, you, if it's one of those nights that the pot's going to freeze solid, it might be for me in zone 7b, there might only be 10 nights the whole winter that I'd bring them up on a porch or into the kitchen or something like that. The rest of the time I want them outside in the air movement and allowing them to dry out between waterings. Uh, it's one of those things I probably only have to water twice the whole winter once they've gone to sleep. Okay, uh, so somebody did s some sort of um, hugel culture type bed and this this is the process of, of putting like logs and sticks and limbs at the bottom of a raised bed to take up some of that space this is an old this is a very old gardening technique and then that stuff will break down over the years and actually feed your plants but it takes up a lot of that space at the bottom then they put a layer of cardboard in and then they put uh, a raised bed soil and compost and then they planted their plants and their plants are off color. Now, I would imagine that you've loved a bit, that, uh, that raised bed garden soil is typically stays very wet and then compost has a tendency to be heavy and uh, easily waterlogged as well. So I'm, I'm guessing it's just your stuff is staying too wet uh, in that mixture. Uh, I wouldn't remove the mixture. If you could find some pine bark uh, fines or pine bark, even pine bark mini nuggets, uh, just some sort of bark like that, and blend that into that soil and create some air in it. And uh, I think you'll be better off going forward. You might also want to add some rock dust to it. That's something you can probably find on Amazon uh, or a garden center uh, near you. But uh, that, all of that organic material that you've planted stuff in uh, doesn't really have any of the mineral content that actual soil would. So a clay-based soil, as annoying as it is to dig in, is full of nutrients. Uh, so, um, whereas, you know, compost has them, but it runs out, it can run out of them rather quickly. It doesn't have an endless supply of, nutri of nutrients. So, uh, uh, so you might want to add some rock dust to it and then put something into it to make it drain a little better. But I think you're just loving your stuff to death. Um, and uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of that, a lot of that bag stuff that's sold at some of the stores, the planting mixes and raised bed mixes, I think they just hold too much water in general, but it's beautiful black soil. So it must be great. Oh my gosh, look at it, look at it, look at it, it's black. Um, this, there's nothing, there wasn't anything black in the soil. I put down some, you know, I say this every week, I just put down some wood chips and some compost and that gets mixed in with the clay. The clay that most people would just despise uh, planting in and everything looks this lush. It's that combination of the two, not just the beautiful black soil, but also the clay. Uh, that, that combination is actually, 
the recording stopped. But that's what gives a garden everything it needs without me having to put constant inputs into it. It's, it's the combination of the two things together. Okay, so somebody asked me about killing their lawn with wood chips. Uh, and then somebody commented down below that, that they might want to put cardboard down on top before they put the wood chips. Good suggestion. Uh, what I did here was I just took the lawnmower and I scalped it off to the ground. And so I started at, you know, a setting of two on the lawnmower and I mowed it. And then I went to one and then I went to half an inch. And I scalped this to the ground as much as possible. And then I put the wood chips on top of that and it killed almost everything. I've actually got some Bermuda grass over here coming up through something. It's still, I've been fighting since day one uh, in one little pocket over here. And it's just because I planted a Veronica in the middle of it. Uh, and I can't, they almost look alike. So it's hard to pull them, get them apart. But it killed most everything out here. Um, and I didn't use cardboard. But again, cardboard would have worked great. But I, I would encourage you to scalp the grass really ridiculously low before you do any of the other. Uh, that, that helps the process. Um, of killing it as well. Okay, so oh, somebody asked, so, somebody commented on, I, I went through kind of the history of the channel how I had last week about how I started shooting the videos at the nursery and then the garden center and then my old house and then this house and then all over the country this summer. Uh, and they said they liked the old videos from the nursery because they used those individual plant videos um, when they're researching plants. And that's what the purpose of the Garden Channel, Garden Plants with Jim Putnam channel is. If you're not subscribed to the Garden Plants with Jim Putnam channel, haven't put a video up there in about two months. I have shot videos for it. And I'm talking to an editor right now about helping me edit uh, those videos for that channel. I haven't been able to find an editor for this main channel. And the reason for that is I would have to teach them this language um, that I'm speaking, <laughs> you know, as I'm teaching you guys in the hundred, you know, this 150, uh, question and answer videos and, and the 1200 videos on this channel uh, y you know I it, it's hard to find an editor for something like this because I'm sending them a foreign language to them you know they're great at editing much better than I would ever be but they're not necessarily understanding the words that I'm saying and what pieces of fo video footage would go with that particular thing that I'm saying that kind of thing but the Garden Plants channel is a little more formulated, so I'm looking for a video editor for that, and I'm talking to somebody now about that. So videos are gonna start going up on that channel on a regular basis, and again, I actually have videos shot for it, uh, but I've been so busy with the other channel and other things this summer that I haven't gotten them up, but uh, they are coming back, <laughs> but on the Garden Plants with Jim Putnam channel. Okay, uh, so somebody asked, um, Oh, they've got, they put down wood chips that have been breaking down. They've put down wood chips for a couple seasons. Now they want to build some little raised, raised beds in that area. Wanted to know if they can just put the soil and the compost over top of the wood chips. I wouldn't. I would pull back the wood chips that haven't broken down. And so I'd go in there with a garden rake and just pull down to where you're getting down to the humus layer that, that those wood chips have created. So I'm gonna get the biggest, chunkiest pieces out of there and leave behind the stuff that's almost broken down or is broken down, then put my soil and stuff on top. I don't wanna bury that wood material under the ground that deep, because then again, it will create a situation where there's no air and there's no light and it rots instead of feeding microbes. Uh, so pull that stuff back and then use it somewhere else. But leave the humus layer that you've built uh, you'll, 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 you'll definitely see a difference. I mean, when you, when you start pulling back the chunkier stuff, you'll very quickly find the material that's broken down enough to just leave in place. That's the way I would do it. Somebody asked me if I get eaten up by mosquitoes. I actually sprayed with the organic off stuff that's just some sort of scented stuff before I sat down here. You'll see me sometimes in these videos doing this and it annoys people. There's always some comment down below. Why do you keep touching your legs? Why? Um, that's the reason why. Uh, there are mosquitoes out here, and uh, I'm in a 90-year-old neighborhood, and so, you know, there's all kinds of things buried in the ground here. There's gutters and, you know, that don't drain well, abandoned things. Plenty of mosquitoes in a neighborhood like this. We got about one in ten neighbors that hires the mosquito people to come in and fog their yard, um, you know, uh, and uh, you know, just makes me angry, honestly. I mean, I've got this incredible pollinator garden over here and we, we you know, we know these are, these are pesticides. I mean, are there, um, 
uh, you know, these are, these are insecticides that kill all insects, you know, uh, that they're spraying. And uh, uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of annoying. Uh, but the, people stopped putting the signs up. The mosquito company got, had talked all these people into putting a sign in their front yard of how proud they were of the service. And uh, that backfired on them on a Facebook group, which I'm not part of. I am, you know, Facebook is just an angry place. I'm, I, I, do very, I do no Facebook. Um, but the Facebook group, for the neighborhood, you know, people got angry uh, at those people. They at least don't have the signs anymore. I'm assuming they're still getting it sprayed though. Uh, I have no idea. And then there's entire communities that get sprayed. I was in Tybee Island last week. I'm, I'm assuming the entire island is probably spraying, uh, you know, for mosquitoes for to keep, to keep people coming back to the beach every year and spending their money. But, uh, you know, there's mosquitoes back here. I can't do anything about it. It's summertime in the South. It rains about every third afternoon. What are you gonna do? It's a 90 year old neighborhood. Uh, if I sprayed for mosquitoes, I would be, you know, I'd be killing all these things I'm inviting into my yard. What a cruel joke, um, you know, that would be. Okay, uh, let's see. Hydr uh, so somebody's hydrangea paniculatas are not turning pink. They have some sort of variety that starts off green and then white and then goes to pink. Uh, mine have gone right to brown as well this year. <laughs> Uh, and mine, I just have one that just normally becomes papery. Uh, you know, it starts off green and then white, you know, white wedding over here. And they've just gone completely uh, brown on me. I don't know if it, the soil is still a bit dry, uh, if that's what that is, or it's just been this weird, the whole weird year combined of a dry, cool spring followed by an extremely hot and dry early part of the summer. You know, I don't, I don't know, but they, but they definitely, all of the hydrangeas, um, have ended poorly. <laughs> They've bloomed beautifully and then, you know, ended poorly. Okay, last question for this week. Somebody from Australia, because um, I said that uh, the state of Texas has over 10% of the views on the channel. Uh, somebody from Australia asked, um, was curious as the Australian views on the channel. So I went and looked and Australia has 1.7% of the views uh, on the channel. And there's uh, mil more than a million views a month. So, you know, it's, a not, it's not a small number. 1.7 sounds like a small number, but it's, in, it's, 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 it's a lot of views. Uh, internationally, outside of the U.S., Canada has 4.3. The U.K. has 3.1. Uh, then Australia was third, uh, fourth behind the United States, uh, 1.7. And then India has 1.1. 1 .1. uh, everything else was below 1%. So, Thank you from wherever you're watching, uh, and uh, I'll be back next week with a garden question and answer video. You can ask questions down below this one. Thanks for watching.